Uh, but to start with, um, Ken Lin uh, from Parsons Brinkerhoff uh, is going to talk to us about uh, uh, land use uh, and BRT, and particularly uh, with an emphasis on uh, experience from the States, uh, uh, where Ken is based. Well, thank you. I'm actually happy to be back in Cambridge. I, I studied in Cambridge, Cambridge, Massachusetts. <laughs> It's a very poor school. They could only afford uh, three letters. Um, uh, so anyhow, one of the letters starts with M. Anyhow, the, um, what I'm here to talk about is a challenge of planning in low-density suburban settings, which is a very common aspect of uh, United States uh, town planning. This is a, sort of the outline, so hopefully I can keep to that. And one of the uh, old, uh, well, a bit of audience uh, participation here. Uh, show of hands of those who've been to um, any U.S. city in, the, um, in America. Oh, okay, great. So I have to be careful what I say. Um, and uh, any uh, show of hands of anyone who's been to the suburban areas of those cities. Uh, okay, a little bit fewer. Great. Well, the reason why I uh, asked that question is because old images on movies, and oftentimes movies uh, depict things a little bit inaccurately or uh, misrepresent, is that... People work in these tight clusters of employment, such as lower Manhattan, and they commute on trains. That's actually an image from uh, the man with the gray flannel suit. We might see Gregory Peck in there somewhere. And uh, that's how they get to and from work. Well, they still do that. And notice the modern style offices. Um, this is part of the new um, dress as you wish work style. But most people actually work in these types of lower density settings. Why well, this is particularly important to transit is because these are really hard to serve by public transit. It's been one of those vexing issues. And so what I'd like to do is uh, walk you through one of our recent projects, which is out on Suffolk County. Now, I understand there's a Suffolk uh, County here in uh, somewhere in England, but um, I think we had it first. Um, <laughs> at least that's what we always like to think. Um, there are actually Americans who do believe that, by the way. Um, and if you, just to kind of give you a bit of orientation, uh, Manhattan is uh, right about in this bit here where it says Manhattan. That's where all those uh, lovely skyscrapers are. Um, actually, my apartment is somewhere about there. And about 50 miles uh, by uh, the train or the railway is um, uh, Suffolk County and the study area, which is this area called Route 110. Very bucolic area. Uh, it ranges to Montauk Point, 118 miles out, further than Philadelphia is. And the reason why we show these solar panels is because uh, this area is, uh, they call it the high-tech main street of Long Island of Suffolk. And they're trying to go green with sustainable measures. For instance, any building over 400,000, uh, no, let me try that again. Any building over 400, for over 4,000 square feet on this, uh, in Suffolk County in this Route 110 corridor has to get LEED certification. Here's a little bit about the study area. Route 110 is this uh, formerly bedroom commuter shed community. It's been transformed over the recent years into a high-tech biological university uh, quarter, and they want to keep more of the same. One thing about the United States is people love to move. Uh, I think on average, um, the typical US person in their lifetime can be expected to move to at least 12 different places. And, and the reason why this is, uh, uh, I mentioned this is because cities and towns are in Great competition to try to get the best and the brightest to work and settle in their area. And so Suffolk County and this, uh, this quarter is no different. This is just a few photos of the uh, study area. It ranges from eminently walkable, such as in Amityville, which is also the name of a movie, um, Amityville Horror, but it's actually quite a lovely place, uh, to uh, some of the more big box places, which to me are a bit more the real, where the real horror is. Uh, and this is actually a, a regional shopping center here, uh, the Walt Whitman Mall. The reason why this person's standing underneath this tree is for shade. It's about 85 degrees, 90 degrees on this particular day, and there's no bus stops open. But we're doing pretty well because the bus is actually allowed to go into the shopping center, which is not always the case in most US cities, where the buses are excluded and kept at arm's length. Um, they, they feel, I've actually had one client which said, well, we don't want the buses to come in because uh, people will shoplift and make their getaway on the buses. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's either a very sad commentary on what they think of the bus customers or a very ringing endorsement on the reliability of the buses. <laughs> I'm never sure which one's which. <laughs> so here are some of the challenges. Uh, highly autocentric. Uh, one of the problems in these uh, low density suburban areas is uh, they tend to be prosperous. Um, the reason why that's a problem is high rates of automobile ownership. 
You actually get folks, and I, I kid you not, who will say, well, I, I can't take the bus, because if I take the bus and my colleagues see me coming in my bus, they'll think I've lost my license uh, due to some kind of drink driving charge, uh, or something, uh, or I'm too indigent to uh, keep up with the car payments. Uh, and that's really sad when that happens. So what we want to do is we want to turn the paradigm, shift it around to try to grow more of the market and to make uh, using the bus service a bit more socially uh, uh, fun and acceptable. Here's some of the challenges. Uh, on this quarter, which is, by the way, about 12 miles from end to end, um, the transit's low visibility. Now, this top photo is actually one of the better bus stops. It's got a proper shelter. But if you look closely, other than the advertising, you'll see there's no other graphical information. There's no schedule. There's no time. You show up at the shelter, you could be waiting for hours. If you show up on a Sunday, you'll be waiting till Monday because there's no bus service on that Sunday. <laughs> That's not the way we want to welcome folks aboard. And it gets stuck in traffic, and this is actually uh, operating on Route 110 itself. Route 110 is uh, kind of like a flat freeway, uh, oh, sorry, motorway, um, with what we call Jersey barriers. Um, they're very pedestrian-friendly features. You can't walk over them very easily, and uh, you oftentimes will have a 150-foot right-of-way, curb to curb. So it's um, not very pedestrian-friendly. And there's uh, no shortage of traffic. One of the major motorways, the Long Island Expressway, uh, cuts through the study area. This is the high occupancy vehicle lane. They're supposed to move very quickly. Uh, you can see that the traffic doesn't really. Uh... What we want to also do is strengthen the connections between the local Long Island Railway service, which was the railway lines shown on a few maps ago. Uh, and this is the Suffolk County Transit Bus Service. And we want to have convenient, close connections, ideally within steps. And this is um, some of the elements that we're trying to do to improve the BRT planning, to make that low visibility transit more high visibility. And some of these things you've heard from other speakers. So we're all kind of on the same theme. One is you absolutely have to have attractive stations that are welcoming. They provide information. Uh, real time is better. Uh, static as well, because the real time signs um, are a supplement. Um, oh dear, things seem to have gone a bit blurry with this shot down here. Um, yeah, but we try to keep transit in focus despite this uh, lack of blur, uh, blur, uh, this blurriness. And also the uh, uh, attractive vehicles. Now, companies like Toyota uh, and uh, other companies spend a lot of money every year on trying to come up with the latest models and ideally have you refresh your cars every two years. The transit buses have oftentimes been just seen as rather utilitarian vehicles where you just get people on buses and many transit operators have you know, will say, well, it doesn't matter what the bus looks like, people will just ride it no matter what. Well, I, I reject that notion because I think style matters and the ambiance matters. Stations, very important. No cookie cutter approach, no um, uh, one size fits all. They're all, we'd like to have a, a bespoke design, not necessarily custom design for every instance, but to at least reflect local climatic and political sensitivities. Phoenix, Arizona, up on the top, is a rapid transit service, a BRT service that I uh, helped uh, design and implement. You'll notice that the shelters um, would not work at all in New York City. There's no wind screening. Uh, it's um, not at all conducive for cold weather environments, but Phoenix is in a desert. Uh, 114 degree temperatures, uh, but it's a dry heat, so it's not as bad as it sounds. And it's, um, so the shelters reflect that. Here's the orange line in Los Angeles, another project that I helped implement. Here the shelters look the equal of uh, many light rail stations, uh, artwork, uh, ticket vending machines, real-time message signs, the full array of services. And we want to also provide uh, other measures to speed the trip, such as level boarding, prepaid uh, proof of payment fare collection. So what are we going to do for the Route 110? Well, here's one of the first things we want to do. We want to give some advantage to the uh, bus. Now, remember, highly auto-centric environment. This is very typical. So wouldn't it be lovely if we could convert this uh, shoulder lane into a bus transit lane? In the US, it's um, practically political suicide to talk about taking away a general traffic lane. You, so we have to try to work at, uh, on the fringes where we can and start with baby steps of uh, trying to take away a shoulder lane, which is less uh, objectionable. Transit signal priority and queue jumps. I was very impressed yesterday that you could actually see the transit signal priority activate because in the US, um, the, many of the traffic engineers and highway engineers are very conservative. They don't want to bollocks up the uh, regular traffic. So uh, as a result, um, you have to uh, be very, very careful. 
but yesterday I could see the signal progression, so it was very nice. So you get solid value out of that. And it's very comforting as a customer to see the ch signals change as the bus approaches. Now, one of the uh, speakers yesterday was talking about how can we get better shuttle connections and how can we make uh, the last mile connectivity better uh, between the trunk routes and the uh, mainline routes. This is a very, very big challenge in uh, the Route 110 quarter, and I'll show you on a couple maps. One idea that I thought of was we have a mainline BRT service that runs up and down Route 110, but the problem is a service that only runs up and down 110 will be condemned to failure, in my opinion, because many of the businesses, the employment centers, are beyond the traditional accepted walking distances of maybe one to two miles. Very unreasonable to expect folks to do that. So the idea is, why don't we have timed guaranteed shuttle connections that meet the mainline service and makes that last mile connectivity. Oh, and by the way, since there's a new railway station we want to reopen, it can also serve that. And it can be at no extra fare, a time connection. This kind of service works very well with trains meeting buses in California. We also uh, had uh, ideas of putting in uh, limited stop bus services and pairing it with an existing local bus service. Here's an example of how you try to serve a low density area with an existing bus service that tries to be all things to everything. And it has this wonderful uh, routing. It comes in express uh, on the Long Island Expressway. That's that photo that you saw with a chock full of cars. And then it goes around and serves these industrial parks and office parks. And it's, it's you know, you get a wonderful tour uh, every morning of your commutation. That's not the pa pattern that we want to use uh, because that's uh, probably going to test uh, the patience of most people. After a while, the novelty begins to wear off of seeing the same industrial parks every day. So, a uh, quick tour. This is uh, the Long Island Railroad main line. Uh, 50 miles to the west is New York City. Over here is uh, Republic Station. This area here will have a huge TOD site, which I'll show you in a few seconds. And then there's this college, a state college here at Farmingdale. And these big square blotches, the bigger the square, the more people. The smaller the square, the uh, fewer uh, people, but, but these are all major employers. And this green line is the 110 quarter. Now, for the purposes of uh, enlargement, there's more parts to this, but this is the primary focus, uh, and this, the quarter continues north and south, and north is in this direction. So to make that last mile connectivity, one idea is why don't we have shuttle buses, uh, such as the blue, the yellow, the red, that all are bracketed, bookended, shall we say, at this uh, Republic Station down here, and at a new transit center up there, and they can make timed, guaranteed connections to resolve that last mile connectivity. Now, we put on our thinking hats, and I thought, well, we need to do more. How can we make these BRT shuttles work better? One thing that if you go to Google Maps or Bing uh, Maps is you'll see that a lot of these sh uh, shuttles, uh, the parking lots um, often touch, but there's like a tree line or a fence line, and that's due to different property ownership. And there's no street grid and it makes it very difficult to serve the different office complex. Here's one, these are about uh, six-story tall buildings, uh, and they're, they're really hard to serve by traditional arterial streets. The traditional arterial street routing would be something like this. So one thought that occurred to me is, what if we ran through the backs of the office buildings, and maybe with a 10-yard segment of uh, pavement, uh, a driveway, shall we say, we could then offer more direct service and create new patterns. Obviously, this would be for the BRT shuttle. You wouldn't be burrowing through this at very high speed, but it does save some circuitous travel. If you like that idea, and then you said, wait a minute, why don't we also put a centralized BRT station serving different complexes in the backs? Now, this is a little bit counterintuitive. Most BRT planning, you put the stations in the front on the arterial streets. Why would I want to even suggest such a crazy thing as putting it in the back? And the reason for that is, it's not a lot of fun waiting out here during the winter time when it snows, and it does snow um, and it rains, and you're standing next to 45 mile an hour traffic uh, being hit by road spray and such. Uh, far better to put it back here, and this is where most people park. They park in the backs and they usually use the back door. The uh, front door is kind of more of a ceremonial door. So you actually can have a, a sheltered area uh, which is centrally located. Then after we do all these good things uh, with the stations, the uh, vehicles, Branding is exceptionally important, and this is back to the car companies. Toyota has branded uh, with Lexus as a, the deluxe line. In Phoenix, we did that with the rapid service up here, uh, helped out with the branding. This is for the uh, metro service in the orange line. And I've had actually friends of mine who are quite normal uh, friends, they say, well, we never write the um, regular bus in Los Angeles, it's just too grotty. But the uh, rapid service, that's okay, we'll ride that. 
And the same thing happened in uh, Phoenix. Uh, we had focus groups. We actually asked customers, um, motorists, uh, what would it take to get you out of your car and onto our car? And um, we used some of that uh, uh, into the design. And so here's some of the features that uh, we learned from what they were interested in and what we tried to emulate, which is also some of the crowd-pleasing features of uh, light rail. You heard earlier, keep it simple, simple routes. Some of my friends who are schedule planners, they love uh, complicated uh, routes that deviate and have sub-detours, and then they have different trip patterns, and maybe four or five different patterns by time of day. Good for the transit enthusiasts, not so great for the general public who likes it simple. Fewer stops is always fun, uh, but uh, at the same time, that's a balancing act. And uh, the other thing is, this is really important, high quality service. In Phoenix, we actually set the fare up um, about 50% higher than the regular base fare. The crowd loved it. Ridership is strong, it's wonderful. Because there's a strange psychology that says if you pay more, you value the service more. It's like why a Gucci handbag uh, tends to do better than say one at a Kmart or a Woolworth handbag, or why uh, a Lexus uh, gets um, um, more uh, cachet than uh, say a, a Yugo or something. I mean, there are some quality differences and people perceive it, they're willing to pay for that. A little bit about the uh, land use planning. Uh, Republic Station I mentioned, which is proposed, uh, well, here it is on Google. It's in this site, it's right now industrial. Used to have a train station once upon a time. Uh, and it actually used to be a, a, uh, an Air Force, no, actually, there's a general aviation airport, and then it used to be um, um, a, a military aircraft base, uh, sort of similar to on the Cambridge uh, uh, busway. So one of the, um, under a separate contract, nothing to do with us, was um, a TOD designer. And uh, sometimes people are TOD in name only. He came up with um, a plan for transit-oriented development. Now, we have sometimes pitched uh, heated discussions about this because his idea is here's the train station on an embankment, uh, clock tower. Every train station has to have one in the US. And he thought, well, instead of having uh, the buses uh, right on the opposite side of the platform, which is what I try to advocate for so that you alight from the train and your bus is 10 meters away, or not even 10 meters, five meters away, um, he said, well, no, no, I want people to experience the um, fun of shopping, um, uh, retail shopping, and so let's make it 200 feet away. Uh, and I said, but 7 a.m., no one's going to be wanting to shop. Stores are going to be shut. People want to get to their office. They want to make the connection as close as possible. Uh, we want to do it more like in Switzerland. So these are some of the tussles that we have with, with well-minded individuals. I, as far as I know, he doesn't go home and kick the dog and beat his kids, but uh, sometimes they just get it wrong, in my opinion. So that's part of the challenge. Uh, and we want to add uh, more density, diversity, uh, uh, and here are some examples. This is actually a, a rendering we did for another project in White Plains on another project. And the reason why I show these rel relatively low-scale densities is because in the suburban settings, if you talk about density, uh, the average person is horrified. They're, they're thinking you're going to transplant lower Manhattan into their uh, lovely town and uh, ruin the scale and the characteristic. And you know, we're not talking about that. We're just talking about uh, higher density but with a lighter touch. Here's an example in St. Louis um, uh, Park, which is just outside of uh, Minneapolis. Uh, high quality environment. Uh, uh, here's retail on the ground floor, residential units of different types on the top, and uh, a nice uh, public focal point in space. So these are some of the things we want to do to try to keep it interesting and lively and vibrant. Why this is important is because the transit service uh, alone can't do it all. Uh, we, have to, we have to provide a good transit service, but we also have to do something in the long run to make Route 110 uh, more user-friendly. On every planning study, you have to have these kind of maps showing the land use densities, so we have our uh, requisite ones. I don't expect you to read the uh, key here, but basically it's primarily big box retail and uh, commercial, and there's some emerging residential. And what we want to do is um, identify soft sites, which are these areas shown in red, and uh, these are the easy, uh, low-hanging fruit areas that could be easily converted to more uh, uh, denser transit-oriented development. Here's an example. This is a golf driving range. You can see the netting. Uh, you can see the fine characteristics. It's almost, uh, I, I sometimes confuse this with the Champs-Élysées in Paris. It's, it's so similar. Um, the ambiance is, uh, anyhow, it's just, Okay, maybe not the Shanzo um, say one of the side streets, perhaps. And so what if we uh, reimagined it a little bit differently? Now, this uh, block-style architecture isn't to suggest something of Cumbernauld. It's just a, kind of a massing diagram. But the idea is to show how we could put in BRT lanes with the, the uh, 
uh, pavement uh, treatments, level boarding platforms, um, different type of buses, replacing that uh, center guardrail of the lovely galvanized steel with maybe all these lovely uh, plantings and such, and creating pedestrian crosswalks, animating the sidewalks. This is on that same site of the uh, golf driving range, and then putting in mixed use. And again, the reason of why we do this is because we want to make the conditions favorable for using transit. This is not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen even in 10 years uh, to the extent, but you've got to start the ball rolling. We want to use the transit as an organizing element and use that as a way to encourage developers, but at the same time, have enough elements that it says to a developer, yes, this is not an ephemeral transit service that's going to disappear over the next election cycle. It'll be around for a while. That's one of the advantages of the Cambridge busway. Uh, you have made that investment in a guided busway. It's not going to disappear overnight. And this is one of the big concerns in the U.S. about bus transit. Well, the bus transit could be um, eliminated by the pen stroke due to a budget cut. And then where would you be? So here's um, um, the very quintessential uh, American holiday called Halloween. People don't usually dress like this. Um, and uh, the idea here is that we want to create these favorable aspects of quality of life. And this is what I mean by the integrated solution. I think this is the penultimate slide, which is that you have a good BRT mainline service. You combine that with shuttle service for a last mile connectivity. Uh, so that this way, as an example, you don't have to deviate off the busway to serve a new development. You can uh, create shuttles. Uh, and then these are the other aspects. So why do we do this again? There's oftentimes a tendency to think of transportation planning as uh, for the sake of transit planning, and that's fun. We enjoy that. But the bigger picture is for our client. We want to make Suffolk County, the one in New York, uh, very, very competitive, a good place to work, keep the uh, workforce, keep the young people from moving out to attract others to move in, and to keep the property tax base uh, vibrant and healthy because Suffolk County realizes that they're in global competition for a very talented workforce. They want to attract the biggest, the best, the brightest. Uh, I shouldn't say biggest, but the best and the brightest. And um, we really have a problem with um, uh, um, expanding girth. Uh, uh, that's another story uh, to do with walkability. But uh, the idea is that we want to make sure that uh, we uh, do the, the, labor, uh, the groundwork for uh, economic mobility, and uh, this is where transit and TOD can help. So thank you very much.